Uh, the agrophenology is basically a nature-based planting calendar. And we have with us Stephen Carlson, uh, who's going to be really digging deep, uh, giving us a 101 on phenology. Uh, but I'm going to start us off first with a thanks, University of Minnesota and the Department of Agriculture for the funding of this. Uh, and we're going to um, kind of go through a, an exciting uh, set of slides uh, to see what this whole agrophenology is all about. Um, so uh, I was looking at phenology and the changes of phenology that we can learn. And I was looking at agriculture and I was trying to figure out could these be a way to adapt to the changes in weather patterns and climate? Uh, so as we are approaching new times with carbon increasing in the atmosphere and weather and certainly uh, overall global temperatures getting warmer, what we have noticed around the, the world and in Minnesota that some of the storms can be pretty uh, drastic, pretty exaggerated storms. Um, as we look at, uh, you know, drastic weather, uh, we're getting to see more and more of it. We're not getting the hurricanes, but we're certainly getting changes in our weather patterns. Uh, we're seeing it floods, whether you see the pictures of, on the left from Duluth or flooding our fields, we're getting dry periods, out west was very dry. So we're seeing some, a little more extreme weather. Uh, in our area, you know, sometimes it's hard to get to the fields. We had uh, a foot of snow in mid-October this year, um, and other times it's really warm and wet. Uh, so lots of different things. The other thing we're noticing is a lot more bugs coming up into our crops that are southern cutworms uh, to add to our northern cutworms, each doing a different part of the plant. So all of these pose challenges to our planting calendar because we used to be able to just say, let's plant this. March 1st every year. But with all the changes, it's not really working out too well. And in fact, it's gotten a little bit of frustration trying to figure out when to plant relative to when we historically planted using our calendar. So today's gonna to be looking at this approach and figuring out new ways. So we're gonna do it in two ways. One, the agro, check out crops health and growth related to timing. Do some research on that. And I'll share some of that. And also in the phenology part is identify and evaluate plants, insects, mammals, migratory animals, species, determine their reliability in providing a better planting calendar. If we can put those two things together, we're building a more reliable nature-based planting calendar. Okay, thank you, David. Um, and let's get started. We'll. Uh, move forward. Okay, so the idea of phenology. Again, it's obviously been around for a long time, but it, the word pheno was uh, defined as the, it's a Greek word that says first appear and more in 1849. So, um, you know, almost uh, 175 years ago, came up with it. No, not quite that long, but um, realized this concept of uh, monitoring and studying plants and life cycles of both plants and animals. So we're typically looking at uh, seven features or phenophases in, in plants and about four or five in, in animals. So you can see it's really, we're looking at most often when they first start to appear. Next. And this has been around for a long time. Up on the upper left side, we see a calendar that came out of the 1600s in Europe where they really identified um, different harvesting and uh, planting. And so basically these are, are phenology events in the life cycle of, uh, of a farm. And on the right, you see uh, a a calendar, a planting calendar, maybe similar to something that you're familiar with, but this came out of the 1800s in the northeast part of, of the country here. So it was telling us when to plant and how long before we harvested the crops. Next. Okay, so um, 
again, this fits in well with what David was talking about in terms of the, the shad bush or the June berry. Uh, the shad uh, fish would be swimming upstream in, in Canada, and that's when you would harvest that fish when um, the June berry uh, was blooming. Or you may have heard of you plant the corn when the oak leaves are the size of uh, a squirrel's ear. So the idea that that's when you're supposed to be planting uh, your corn. Okay, next. So I mentioned this word phenophase. Really the phases are each plant and animal goes through these um, cyclical phases. So breaking bud, uh, leaf, um, and, and then, uh, you know, flower and seed. And so all these stages and eventually leaf drop, these are phenophases. It's kind of a, a term that um, you are probably very familiar with, just but may not have used that, that terminology to describe what's going on. So Linnaeus published a book in 1756 that really looked at phenological data. That was sort of the first record that we have of long-term phenological data observations. Next. In terms of the longest um, record of phenology, and this is always kind of fun, so I would throw this out to my students and I give them the big aha clue and I wait for them to respond. Very few of them catch it, but uh, it's anybody think they know? Let's jump to the next one. It's the cherry blossoms in Japan. And if you look 850, is when they started recording in history uh, the blossoms when they bloom. Now, if you look at that in up to two, 2000, uh, you can see the, the significant changes over time. And we're, we're talking about climate change. David was referring to that. You can definitely see how the last 50 years have really, um, the, the arrival of the cherry blossom is considerably um, earlier than it was eight, 50. And the other piece you can uh, recognize is that why would they have kept that data for so long? It's because it was a, a holiday. It was the time when everybody had the day off from work. And so that was how it was recorded over time. Next. Oh, and by the way, the Japan, the um, Japan gave those same cherry trees to Washington, D.C. So um, you are still following the same genetic uh, species in, in DC. Okay, so uh, Nina Leopold Bradley, who is the daughter of Alda Leopold, uh, when she moved back to um, the shack in Sand County, uh, Alda Leopold wrote Sand County Almanac. So he wrote that book in the 1940s. He was collecting phenological data for a number of years at the shack. And what, then when Nina arrived in the late 1980s, uh, she started re recording those same phenological events. And then the fun part was they could look at their father's data and their data and start to see the responders. In other words, those plants and animals that were coming earlier and those that did not respond. So some were responding to the temperature and others were responding to daylight um, or maybe the moon or something. But the non-responders um, like the fox sparrow uh, and, and the Eastern Phoebe, um, you, you could see the responders which were coming earlier and then the, and the plants that were blooming earlier and those plants that were staying constant. Um, and so that was kind of the first awakening that we realized, ah, phenology is not hitting every species the same. Next. So Minnesota, we all are familiar with um, our, um, different uh, land prairies and, and woodlands and, and uh, oak savanna forests that we have uh, and boreal forests. So, but it's the borders that we have here that um, you know, the, these biomes are affected, that are mostly affected by, by climate change. So that's where we're gonna see possibly the greatest uh, variances um, in the next 30 to 40 years. Next. So we often in, uh, look at climate and we think of um, over time. So we have records for well over a hundred years of climate in Minnesota, but we're starting to see these trends 
um, like the warmer climates in the last um, couple of decades. Next. But more importantly is to look at the, what we call um, the shoulder seasons between the four major um, fall, winter, spring, and summer. And you can start to notice that on the shoulder seasons at the end of each of those seasons, you see these bursts of red, which means warmer climate in the last um, 10 to 20 years. And it, those climate, those, those are where we are starting to recognize some of the biggest impact that um, climate change is having in Minnesota, especially when we're looking at our crops and um, uh, how long our winter seasons are and things like that. Next. So the impact we can see quickly is on the maple syrup run. It may be a shorter season or it might start earlier. Next. Um, we're starting to predict some of the impact that, let's say, the red oak might be shifting from its current phase in Minnesota, which is more central and southeastern. And we're starting to see that in the next 100, you know, 75, 100 years, it's moving to the northeast. Next. And Minnesota's temperature by uh, in 75 years may be more like um, Minneapolis will be more like Chicago and our uh, that's our winters and our summers might be more like Nebraska uh, and uh, Kansas and things like that. So our, we're predicting some of these changes with with climate change. But I think phenology gives us an opportunity to to study that firsthand. Next. So we saw in 2012 where our um, apple uh, crops and our um, cherries and uh, grapes were highly um, frosted in uh, April when we had an uh, early, actually we had an early uh, spring and then we had a frost. And so it's uh, knowing that our, our agricultural systems are really connected to phenology. Next. So phenological data, it's helping us to model how, how we can make these predictions and what to expect. Uh, so number one is just we can make these observations and then um, recognizing that these observations are local, but they're also related to our weather, our moisture, and things like that. Next. So some of the pieces we've learned, and this is a lot of Rebecca Montgomery's research uh, from the forestry department, is for example, we now know that if we um, can better predict when leaves will be dropping in the fall, or um, sometimes when flowers from trees are dropping, that we can um, send out the street sweepers to collect those leaves instead of having them go down in storm drains into the lakes, and then basically protect the, um, the water system. So the lakes from the nutrients that would be coming uh, from the decomposed leaves and uh, other uh, flower parts. So the idea that we can monitor that over time will actually save money in the long, in the long run. Next. So we have had um, volunteers, citizen science volunteers, help us monitor the, the, the street trees and then better predict when um, those leaves will be dropping and when we can um, hopefully save our, our lakes from nitrogen and, and um, increase weeds that would be a, a byproduct of, of um, those chemical um, outputs. Next. The other thing we noticed by observing and, and plant life for a long time is that uh, this is originally research by Hodson, where they were looking at um, aspen uh, bud burst and recognizing that um, over the since 1940, so 60 plus years of data collection, that um, we're starting to see that this. Um, Aspen is actually, you know, blooming much, much earlier than it did originally. But if you notice the up and down lines, I think that's what people often get, get excited about is we have to look at the average. So we, what's called a regression line really tells us what that average is. Even though we're seeing all of these up and down sort of individual years, it, it's the average overall that helps us better understand um, the, basically climate change. Next. 
So the interesting part about studying and observing phenology is that not all plants are gonna play this by the same rules. And the other thing we discovered in um, about 1920, uh, 2015 is we were looking at um, a you know, 25 year data set of red maple and, and that did not duplicate what was going on with the aspen tree. In fact, it looked really almost like there was no impact. So we were really concerned, why was that the case? And we started to ask around uh, with foresters and researchers in, in the natural resource area, and very few people knew except for the Canadians. Uh, we found a paper that was written by the Canadians, and of course they knew that the maple um, has what's called a chill impact, where uh, the red maple buds so it protects itself against if it has a sp early spring that it won't um, you know break bud early because uh, there might be another frost and so the red maple actually depends on cold weather for it to bloom early believe it or not it's their starch in the bud so um, it's it really is a, a phenomenon that you know is protecting the red maple in the northern um, climates next and it's very similar to what you're probably familiar with, um, the blueberries. And I, I show the greenhouse there because um, the research was done in the 1940s where they discovered that if you grew the, the blueberry in half of the plant inside the, the greenhouse and the other half, you know, that you grew it so it would grow, grow outside in the cold. And the only part of the plant that actually survived and produced flowers was the part that grew in the cold, which then told us that, yeah, the, the blueberry depends on cold climate or cold weather in order for it to produce a flower and then a fruit. So there are other plants and species that are codependent on the cold climate, especially up in your neck of the woods that I'm sure that you could probably better study as you start thinking more about this element of phenology and um, seasonal changes in plants and, and animals. Well, thank you, Stephen, and he'll be around to add, you know, ask questions of later. Um, you know, as we look at being on the north shore of Lake Superior, uh, one thing to note, it is harsh up here. Not only the soil is harsh, but we've had a season where we had a frost July 15th and a frost August 18th and then a freeze 19th, 20th. Now, that was a while ago, but only a few years ago, we had August 23rd as our first freeze. So we can have variable weather, which means we really have to be really sharp with when we plant and how we plant and where we plant. So this research is being done on two farms, Round River Farm, uh, and we run, uh, this is our family farm. We run, a, we ran a CSA, farmer's market, and now we're doing some seed collecting. Uh, originally, I started this grant and project from the Wolfridge Farm when I was running that farm, and now we have Sarah Mayer running this farm. Uh, and so two farms, uh, one's older and more mature soils, the other's newer and connected directly with the, the data uh, that's also collected at Wolf Ridge. So two farms, two different datas that we're kind of exploring what agrophenology can do for us. So first we started with 10 indicator species. We thought, let's do that, but we realized really quick 10 indicator species is gonna be way too small. So we started tracking dozens of species. Uh, Wolfridge has tracked uh, phenological indicators for 33 years. And so we have this huge reservoir of information. So we could identify certain ones we thought might be the most successful, the most responsive, the most telling of what the conditions would be. And we've settled on 25. Now, as we think about our phenological data, and you won't be able to see all this, but you'll get the idea. Um, Wolfridge has a whole set of data that things that will, uh, the phenophase will show up differently in different locations, whether it's at Wolfridge or Round River Farm, three miles apart. Um, and when you look at, say, dandelions, not only do we have uh, the different locations between Wolfridge and ours, but also different locations within the farm. So we have on our farm uh, uh, that in the drier, warmer area in the upper pasture, it coming flower first than the one right next to their cropland. So you have to really be careful, what are you tracking uh, and use the same 
plant or the same group of plants each year to get kind of more consistent data. The other thing to consider is when you're looking at something like lilac, well, why do these two bushes, which were in the same area, uh, bloom at different times? Well, they're two different varieties. So varieties, subvarieties, these are other considerations. Similar location, two different times. So you can't just say plant after the lilac blooms. You have to say plant after the solar panel lilac or the lilac by the greenhouses so that you know uh, you're getting more consistent data because they each have their own conditions and they each have their own natural genetic predisposition for timing. So in this year, 2018, you'll see a lot of blue dates. Those are the late phenological indicators because it was a cold uh, section of spring. But then we had some early ones mixed in. So we're trying to find which ones are the most telling. And when we mapped that out, uh, we had a really warm, warm end of winter. And the maple syrup started flowing way before. And then it shut down March 10th, when maple syrup is only start flowing in our region on March 11th. So it had flown and then shut down a day before when it was normally started. So it was very warm early on, triggering all sorts of stuff. But a majority of our indicators were slowed down greatly. It just cooled off, slowed down, and a majority did. Um, but there are outliners. Uh, but then it warmed up, and we had different phenological indicators, better track, better track conditions, uh, and then continue to warm up. So through a series of, of research, uh, we're trying to identify these right, uh, the best indicators. So, you know, how do these indicators, do they come out early when there's more light, warmer temperatures, growing degree days, warmer moisture? It's inconsistent. So what we found with the data, and we used uh, 19 years of weather data, data and compared them to temperature, uh, growing degree days, both at 50 degree and 30 degree day, moisture is light. And we found that there was no clear definitive evidence of, of common ground, that there is great variability, which actually makes uh, identifying our varieties even more impactful. So it's the uniqueness of different phenological indicators that can probably give us a better trend of what's actually on the ground. And so we've eliminated a whole bunch of indicators because they're not working and not telling us that story of, is it time to plant? Um, so this has been an interesting process. So this is our final tw 25 indicators. And the only one I'll give you caution is the crow. The crow is a very uh, free spirited uh, creature. Uh, it must blow in with the wind sometimes, even when it's cold. It, it varies a little bit. So using the crow solely would not be advised. But in conjunction with the other ones, uh, you'll see here we have birds, we have trees, we have rhubarb, that's an agriculture plant, we have a frog. So a nice combination of indicators. And in May here, as we shift to May, you'll see a bunch of new ones in there, marsh marigold, sugar maple, and black fly uh, uh, populations. And we needed, because so much happens in May for growing, we needed more indicators to really fine tune our planting. Um, and then looking at fall, uh, and I'll tell you why, we added a few new indicators earlier on. We added the snow buntings last year and we added the Canada, Canada geese uh, this year when they're flying south in small groups. And because as we did the research on the crops, and this is my wife, Lisa, planting the crops in different seasons, September, uh, October, and there she is in the snow in November, looking at bulb weight, uh, bulb numbers, bed weight, bulb size, and this is all the different collections all marked and, and managed. Uh, and a bunch of this came from a grant with the Sustainable Farming Association. But what we learned is actually September, which is what when no, no one ever plants garlic in September up here, they plant it in October. But we actually, when we planted it in September, it outperformed. We had bigger size, we had better uh, retention, 
uh, and we had more growth. Uh, and maybe it's our conditions because we get snow early. It may not work somewhere else, but for us, planting in September, we're going to get a better crop. So uh, these are considerations. Planting, we used to go by the snowshoe hair. When the white, the feet on the snowshoe hair turns white, it's time to plant garlic. But now we're planting when the first Canadian geese come in small flocks heading south. And that's about 31 days before the snowshoe hare. So we're changing based on crop study, changing based on what we're learning in phenological. Potatoes, exact amount of seed in exact amount of space and the same fertility soil. Uh, two different timings, June 2nd, June 16th. Planted two weeks apart, but because of the cold soils, the June 2nd planting took 24 days to emerge. But the June 16th one took 17 days. So we started two weeks apart, we ended up one week apart. And by going with the first planting, we healed twice, two times. Going with the second plant, we healed once and we ended up with real close production. Yes, the earlier one produced more, but if you can save one hilling, especially on a big scale, that's a lot of energy saving. So a farmer may say, I'm gonna plant this a little later than I think, lose a little pounds, but save a lot of money because it's not how much you bring in, it's how much you net between the costs of production and your price. So potato trials at Wolfridge, there was no noticeable difference with planting them apart, but they did mention in the research that fertility probably played a role in some of the differences of growth because uh, they're in two different parts. And this is a young farm with new soil. So harder to have that, you have, you have soil as an inconsistent variable within the research. Um, so if you wanna get a, a bigger crop, plant right after the June berries flower. If you wanna get a crop that you only have to hill once and is almost as productive, plant after the hawkweed flowers in our area. Cucumbers, same thing, we found Earlier planting, uh, May 27th versus June 6th, outproduced uh, by many, many, many grams and different cucumbers. Uh, so these are things that we need to consider. How early is right with the new change? So now we're shifting it to the black flies. When they get annoying, and everyone knows when they get annoying, that's when we will plant cucumbers in our greenhouses. Uh, high tunnel tomatoes, we grow them only, you can only grow tomatoes in high tunnels up here. So we had research at the Wolf Ridge Farm. You can see them being planted here. Some of these plants were planted two weeks ahead of the other. But what you found is they caught up with each other, uh, even though there was bigger growth at first, but the production ended up being yields that were similar, very similar. So our timing wasn't that off relative to the best timing to plant. Same at our family farm. We plant in the lettuce. So you have to account for how it's planted. We plant inside the lettuce. So the first planting you can see here, right there. And then the second planting is in there. They're so small you can't see. So you have to also really customize your decision-making to your farm, uh, what's best. By planting early, we, we get that above, but still it was a very bad tomato year as a whole, not enough warmth. And uh, so production wasn't really noticeable between the early or the late. So we're going to keep it the same. We're going to plant the tomatoes where the solar panel lilac blooms. And we're going to keep it that way and keep trying that and see how that goes. Remember, don't plant it by the one by the house or by the greenhouse. You're timed with the one by the solar panel. So using that. Peas. First planting only 11 pounds, second planting 70, 17 pounds. So that was too early. Didn't work out going early, that early because we had less germination, that kind of thing. But the carrots, we had a little bit of difference of weight from the carrots. Should the farmer plant the whole greenhouse a month ahead or save all that time and labor because it didn't work too well for the peas, but it worked a little bit. So those are management decisions with this information the farmer can make. So what we find with early, too early croppings that the next planting will catch up just like it did in potatoes. 
it's true on our farm with the peas. Uh, we plant it every two weeks from May on. Well, we're not gonna plant that first timing anymore uh, because too many didn't germinate because of the cold soil and the conditions. And so instead of planting after the marsh marigold, when we used to plant it, we're gonna plant it after the sugar maples flower. Um, so again, it's not just the phenology, it's connecting the phenology with the actual plant performance that you can optimize your farming operation. Beans, same thing, early ones got eaten by cutworms. So even though they would have done well, the cutworm cycle in the phenological cycle, they came the stage and grew big enough to start eating the beans. So you can keep trying to beat those cutworms. And if you want to keep trying to beat the cutworms, plant them right after the June berries flower. But if you want to save the replanting and all that hassle, plant them after the red osier dogwood. So each crop has its own uh, challenge. Um, so when you mix uh, research in the crops and you mix phenological data and uh, learning about specific indicators, uh, we believe we're developing a more reliable nature-based planting calendar. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to cut and copy um, this, this one, and I'm going to put this in the chat. Uh, if I can find the chat. I'm going to stop sharing so I can find the chat. There we go. If you want to follow along, you can check out this document. Uh, I'm going to go back to zooming and you can just see quickly how we built this calendar. So we've got the phenological calendar, March, crows. After the crow shows up, we plant celery, onions, parsley, peppers, seedlings in the greenhouse to grow. Now, if the crow's late, we don't wait till the crow shows up. We might use the sugar maple and plant the tomatoes, the brassicas with all the other ones uh, to help because we're trying to figure out the best place and using these indicators as samples. So as we move along, we can see that uh, we're getting lots and lots of different plantings at different times based on uh, different scenarios. So when the white-throated sparrow comes, we plant carrots and spinach. When the chorus frogs sing, we plant scallions and cilantro. Now, what we really need to do, if we're gonna really switch to a fully phenological calendar is we're gonna have to switch. You see these first three columns? That's the dates. So let's take those dates out. And now we're just using the phenological indicators directly. So dandelion first flowers, we plant spinach in the fields we plant lettuce, seed, lettuce in the high tunnels, kohlrabi, bok choy, radishes, cukes in the high tunnel. We plant seeds of corn, sunflower, and kooks in our greenhouse to get ready for later plantings in the field. And all of this, I have a task column that can tell me what work I need to do to prepare for these sites. So you have a, a copy of that, those that can uh, look at that link. You can copy that and work it, but. If you want me to send final copies of these templates, um, uh, look to our website, Round River Farm. And it's uh, www.round-river.com. And uh, you can then, in mid-March, I'll have all that stuff posted because my grant report's due in early March. So I'll have that all done. So I'm gonna stop sharing and see if there's some questions, some thoughts. Lorna says she'd like to see these both. At the end of this grant process, I've got to put the final report in for March. At that point, I'm going to have links to phenological indicator, uh, just an open spreadsheet, because you're going to have to customize this to your area so you can start tracking the phenological indicators you want to track. And I'll also have some of these sheets uh, both filled in to look at, but also open so that you can play with them and just, just use them as a basis. But the work and the fun gets to be on your farm and your location because what better way to be in touch with farming but then to be observant. And 
So even if this didn't work, there's a real advantage of me really looking to the environment to see, is it too wet? Is it too dry? What's coming out? So being an observant farmer, uh, you can be better at your craft. Okay. Um, I haven't been keeping a phenology calendar and I would imagine some other people haven't either. Are there any phenology calendars that have been kept for areas in Minnesota that we might add yes. to our own? Okay, yes, so um, Latimer in Grand Rapids area, yeah. he would have phenological in re records for years. That's what was so great. I had Peter Harris with 30 years of phenological data that could be my basis. And then I customize it to the different farms because even though the data was at Wolf Ridge, the farm was in the valley. It has different dates. So that's really exciting. Uh, it makes it more challenging. I can't just send you a phenological chart with all the indicators on there for you. You're gonna have to pick out what you walk by, what you see and what you're observing over time. Larry Weber, uh, just oh. south of the Twin City or south of Duluth has been recording uh, this for, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 years. And he also runs a, a, a you know, a column in the, in the newspaper uh, in Duluth. So Larry would be, and he's written several books. So he would be another person uh, in your neck of the woods that would be able to uh, provide some of those uh, phenos. Another thought which might be interesting, the Minnesota Phenological Network uh, has a, a web page where they are listing um, research that has been at least 20 years plus of people collecting phenological data. So you can go into that website and it's because it was grants that were publicly distributed, it's free to anyone who is willing to look up that, you know, look up that area. So list where you're at and they will show you the, the data from at, you know, a minimum of 20 years of, of, of collection that, that's available. Well, there's, there's sort of a question about, um... How much do you still use the dates or do you just tune in with the natural world and use that? Well, it's, it's really interesting. You continue to cling on to the dates, and go comparative. Like, like when we first put our thermometer to Celsius, we're always like referring back. What, what does that mean you know, in the, in the calendar thing? So the key to it will over time to get comfortable with the patterns. And uh, it depends. I try and let go of the calendar. Lisa holds on to the calendar. Um, and uh, I think it's good to have that duality every now and then. But I'm looking forward to next year just dropping the dates and seeing how that goes. I think it'll be a huge leap forward uh, for real deep observation. I have a question. Um, yeah. So you're saying at the end of the day, the most important data that you can collect is from your specific location, right? Okay. Yeah. And if it's not, like, um, you, like when I was using just Wolfridge's data, use the same data or the same point. Yes. Hi. Um, I was wondering, though, um, as you look at phenological information, whether you also need to consider the phases of the moon, in other words, for planting. I mean, and then there are there are biogenetic also calendars for planting and that kind of stuff. How do you mesh these two systems? Right. Well, and the biologic, uh, the biodynamic calendar is part of the reasons why I decided to do this, um, because I found out the calendars from Germany, um, and I'm here in north central Minas, you know, in north in central North America. And the other thing is um, localizing the data points to something that's right there in front of me. I think it will be more reliable than that. That being said, there's a lot of unknowns about full moon and new moon, but the locals here say, don't plant anything you don't wanna freeze before the full moon in June. Um, so I, I'm quite new to Minnesota. Um, I'm originally from Scotland. Um, so what I've, the only thing I've been doing is kind of tracking 
like pollinators and native insects as far as when they start emerging, when certain native plants start emerging and stuff like that. Um, is, is there a resource other than nature's notebook? Is there a resource specific to Minnesota that kind of leans more towards the insect population for IPM? Yeah, the bee, um, bee labs and pollinators, it's a real big popular um, trend in the last couple of years. So yeah, you could contact the um, University Bee, just U of M bees. Um, there's Journey North, which is, uh, it's really looking at insects and birds, but it's showing sort of their migrations and when they're arriving. Um, yeah, I had a question about, you said that um, crows aren't a good phenological indicator because they're, they have an independent spirit. Are there any other known um, possible indicators that are inconsistent in that same way that you wouldn't want to use as a data point? Right, well, there's also inconsistent within their own timing, but there's also consistent like the hummingbird that shows up the same time, no matter what the weather is. I don't want that either because that's not helpful. The most reliable, which makes sense, are the things that are rooted to the ground you're in because they're dealing with your moisture, your drying, you know, your stuff. The birds are less reliable as a whole. And so okay. we've gotten rid of a lot of, of uh, flying birds and other things from our data uh, points for determining our calendar. And we've relied more on, on the plants, plant world, um, with uh, several exceptions, and the frog is one. Um, and we were watching a beetle for a while, but I don't see the beetle enough to know when the beetle actually showed up. Because So it, it, I had to pick things that I walked by so I could see it quicker, and it, it could be better tracked. I'm still a beginner farmer. I've only been farming for like eight, nine years, but I also teach beginner farmer training programs. And I'm wondering like how many years of data of echophenology indicators should we have in our region before we start incorporating this into like training materials? Uh, I this think, um, I think a couple years so that you start to see patterns with the planting dates, but you would maintain both the dates and the phenology and start to see the patterns. I would say five years maybe um, would be good for someone to do this. Certainly it can be taught at the beginners. I imagine it's land stewardship project, beginner classes. Um, and it can be taught there and, and just these resources could be shared with them to incorporate or not on their farm. Uh, I'm actually really enjoying it. Uh, and it adds a whole another layer uh, to the enjoyment of farming. That's great. I think it also helps folks learn about other areas of their farming, like, you know, pest management, um, weed control, things like that. So I think that's yeah. another key thing. I would like to start tracking um, some of the insects in terms of pest insects, because um, sometimes they're off their cycle as well. They're connected with the environment. And so th that's what we do to beat them. So we try to plant to beat the cycle or to uh, trick the cycle uh, in an organic farming operation. So knowing the insect cycles is really important. Um, like we cover our broccolis uh, all from May till about the third week of June to keep the fly from laying its egg at the bottom of the broccoli and then the pupa eating the stem and then the broccoli falls over. Um, so our later broccoli is great, but customers still want it early. We don't have a tight enough season. So knowing the cycles in timing is really critical to organic farming, where you're trying to outwit and outmanage uh, natural occurrences, because we don't want to get rid of everything. We want to manage and figure out how to create balance between the two. David, is there some flexibility around the, the, around those planting dates? Do you, you know, like, so if you see the first robin, but don't have time to, to get into the field, do you, do you have some flexibility or is there? Yes, you know, less here where we have a shorter growing season each year potential, but yeah. pretty much we use that indicator for after we see that, then when conditions are right. 
And that's what's so lovely about the new timing for the garlic. When mm -hmm. we were waiting till mid-October to plant, it was snowing, it was wet, or all these conditions. Now we can start when the geese go south. So we know we're going to get production, you know, reducing production over time, but we'll still get back to our October numbers if we make. But I can wait for the right conditions uh, so that I'm not pushing something in. Uh, you know, so if I get late, I get late, but I know when I should have planted and now it gives me the opportunity to pick the right time, both for yeah. me as a human, social human and doing jobs and other things, but also me as the farmer making sure I'm not ruining that soil. Right, right, right. Cool. David? Yeah. Yeah. Could the, uh, could the next step in, in whoever's sponsoring these studies be uh, some place to put a database that because yours is a very local study, yes. but it seems to me that if there was a place to gather the data or maybe even a small amount of funding for it. Right. It well, would have to be managed. It's a really good question. And that was a question we had at the one o'clock. We had a lot of people there. And one of those questions was, so how do I do it in my place? How do I get 30 years of phenological data? Well, what's interesting is there's people as strange as Stefan and I uh, in all over the country that are collecting this data. So we have John Latner in central Minnesota. We have, uh, you know, people all around. And S Stephen, if you'd like to share that network, because Elizabeth uh, Beth is in the east. So why don't you share what you know about that network? Okay, so there is a, so Nature's Notebook is, um, is a national uh, website that you can go in and, and you can look at a myriad of plants and animals and insects that would be in your area. And they pretty much have citizen sciences scientists all across the country uh, adding to that, to that um, website. So if you had a specific bird you were observing or a plant or, or whatever. And I, I think the interesting part that I think David is, is suggesting with this agrophenology, well, you know, the two have been around probably since the beginning of time. One person in there in the chat asked about Native Americans and how um, they probably were the original um, agrophenologists, if that is a term, <laughs> appropriate term. And, and so, and maybe even long before, you know, the indigenous, the Anishinaabe that we think about today, they've been doing this literally for centuries. So uh, thinking about, um, two different things happening and they coexist that could predict that the geese flying, who would have thunk that the geese flying would tell you to put your, your garlic in the ground and that there's a correlation between geese and garlic. Um, but in essence, the, you're asking for some type of, of correlation that maybe um, geese are smarter than we think and they know something we don't, so therefore, you know, let's let's tune in to what that behavior is. And anyway, so Nature's Notebook is one site. Um, Journey North is another. There's a number of um, bird uh, sites that you know collect data on observation of bird. And then iNaturalist is the one I forgot to mention um, earlier today that also has. Uh, uh, phenological data that people, citizen scientists, take pictures of the marsh marigolds when they're blooming and it's it's marked on the map. So you can see the sites near you. And if you are in a, you know, in a different state or any part, uh, you can narrow down to what neighbors that you have are recording what observations. You can't see their names, so no names are there, but you can see a dot on the map and you can blow that dot up to, you know, two meters by two meters, you can see the tree that people are observing. Um, and so you, know, you can then see what's going on around you if you've got some ideas. Right, and ideally you'd be observing them on your, near your land by your garden. But if you're using your neighbor's observation that they've been doing well, just keep using it. Because then you have a consistent group of trees, consistent condition. So then you can time your stuff to it um, but you don't want to switch that oak with your oak if they're very different. And so it's okay to use someone else's phenology in your area. Um, just be, just always have them call you or, or always email you every year and say, hey, 
hey, David, and you know, I would get this from Peter Harris. He's a fanatic phenologist. He'd say, hey, David, is your June, Juneberries flowering? You know, because he's been comparing a Juneberry here and a mile away a Juneberry on the lake. And they're like two and a half weeks apart um, because the cold lake and up over the ridge. And that's why I picked this land because the, the hill between us blocks the cold. And then the trees know that and they respond and they change and they tell us a story. Is I'm spending a lot of time observing and what's better for being a, a better farmer than observing. And, and it's making it much more enjoyable. Uh, so so there's, there's so much joy and, and I mean, I'm looking for flowers. <laughs> I'm looking for new growth. So that's really neat, uh, a, a side aspect of agrophenology but I also think it's providing good insights on when we should actually plant. But I didn't realize how important doing the crop studies with it were because things we were assuming we were planting certain times, but we didn't compare production times. And so we've learned a lot more about our crop production and not just done it the same way by the calendar. Well, I'm kind of curious uh, with the farmers in the, in the group here, how many have used this in the past, this, this idea of agrophenology to actually plant or um, harvest or whatever you might uh, be doing? Um, I have used I have used indicators as a hope for optimism or <laughs> optimism. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just a home gardener. Um, uh, but you know every time I see a red wing blackbird and I am in um, just west of the uh, metro so uh, Buffalo, which is in Wright County. And so uh, Usually, um, I'm just ecstatic when I see a red-winged blackbird because I, I usually look at that as the ice thawing in my area. Um, but I've never, you know, if that's way too early to, to be really planting anything, so. And Connie grew up on a, a large grain farm. Do you think your dad used it at all? Do you remember oh, any? So your, your statement about um, observation is, is exactly the way that dad farmed. Um, so he's organic as well. And so you, um, you can't rely on the seed, like specifically around the seeds, you know, he can't put us, you know, conventional seed in his land uh, at the time when they, you know, because of organics. So he always had to gauge soil, soil temperature and making sure that it's that the conditions are right, as you said. And he, he was always, he's always planted his corn very late and people have always wondered you know what are you up to um and then his corn has emerged on at the same time or sometimes earlier than some of the conventional folks so long ways to say absolutely i grew up with with that type of watching so i didn't mention that minnesota does have a phenology uh website so minnesota phenological network um and they um when you were speaking, uh, we went through a couple of years ago and we solicited for people who had recorded data on their farms for at least 20 years. And if it was on the corn crib, wherever they wrote that data down, we then digitized it <laughs> and then um, made it available to the public. So you, you can access that data source. And there's, I think, well over um, 180 different um, sites where people have re recorded at least 20 years or more of could be butterflies it could be um you know different insects or um most of them are flowers El eloisa butler's wildflower garden we hit uh, pay dirt there um where they had you know hundreds of plants when they planted them and when they bloomed and when the seed dropped all on three by five cards um that we then were fortunate to digitize so Anyways, that data is public and available. You can just ask uh, at the web, you know, go to the website and click on, on to say, I, I would love, they'll ask you, how do you want to use the data? And you would say, I want to use it for my farm or, you know, my students, if I'm a teacher or whatever, and they'll then send you the link. Do you ever use uh, other crops you've planted as indicators? Well, yes, the, the rhubarb, but I argue the rhubarb's a little sketchy. It's almost like a, uh, when the snow leaves the ground one. You could say when the snow leaves the ground, but it, now it focused me to the rhubarb plant because when the snow leaves the ground, the rhubarb leaves are coming up. So so it's it's a tricky one. It's almost a snow leave the ground indicator. 
Um, so, but, but that also is important because when the snow leaves the ground, you're getting sun on the soil and you're getting a whole different temperature dynamic. So yes, there are lots of different ones you can use, apple trees blooming, other things like that. So you can cross reference uh, and learn more over time. Just one final thought here in that, in that the, the amount of wisdom that let's say uh, Constance's father or you have David in terms of years of, of actual on the ground wisdom that it reminds me of the, the elders belief that when an elder dies, a library burns because all this knowledge, unless it's recorded somehow is gone. So the next generation is left without it. And we're reinventing what, you know, our grandparents already knew. And we, we've we lost that, that insight um, to those phenological events that are connected to our everyday um, agricultural worlds. Yeah, yeah, we lost our way, got distracted, we're back. <laughs>